where we get started today uh, for our last panel of the day. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering, Professor Jonathan Smith. Well, hi. Well, of course, a major issue is uh, uh, technology. I mean, you know, so the, the last panel uh, was wrestling with issues of technology to inform people and things like that. So um, we have three panelists today, and uh, they're going to talk about uh, technologies uh, with the sort of basic them thematic element that they are to uh, protect and inform about privacy. Uh, Professor Lori Craner is from CMU, and um, she's first up. Thank you. Um, so I have kind of a uh, whirlwind tour through a lot of technology today. I think in general, um, I believe that we can use technology to enhance end user responsibility. I haven't seen too much yet that I think is promising to replace end user responsibility, although uh, I think it's, it's a nice idea if we could do it. Um, I, I do a lot of work in Carnegie Mellon on uh, privacy engineering, which is a very technological approach to privacy. We actually have a master's degree program in that area, and feel free to ask me about that later. All right, so I got involved in this privacy technology idea way back in 1996, and now I feel really old. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, we, we had this idea of coming up with a computer-readable language for privacy policies. And this was going to solve the problem of not having to read all of those long privacy policies because your computer would read them for you and it would do useful things after it read them. And so we spent um, about seven years trying to come up with this standard and um, it, it was P3P. It came out in 2002. It got built into the Microsoft Internet Explorer web browser it got adopted by lots of websites, and um, then it kind of fell apart, and the incentives for adoption just weren't really there in the long term. Um, this is an example of some software that I was involved in building uh, for P3P. So here's an example of a useful thing that you can do, which is have your web browser read the privacy policy and compare it with what you have set up as your personal privacy preferences. And if there's a match, then you get a green happy bird and it made green happy tweets. And if it's a mismatch, you get a red angry bird that made red angry tweets. Um, and so you had both that visual and a very visceral audio uh, indicator. Um, and uh, we, we uh, rolled this out for lots of um, beta users to test and people really liked it. But they had the concern, they said, well, basically I'm going to lots of websites and they don't have good privacy. And my problem is how do I find those that have good privacy? And so it was clear that this wasn't enough. What you also need is a search engine that help you, helps you actually find the websites that have what you want. Um, so then we built something called Privacy Finder that put this privacy meter um, in the left margin next to the search results. So basically what it was doing was um, making a, uh, a search request to either Google or Yahoo, getting back the top 10 results, checking for this computer readable privacy policy, analyzing it, and providing this privacy meter. And we actually did a study to see whether having that information made any difference. We did this in our lab. We had people go shopping online and buy things. And some of them had the meter, some of them didn't. Um, and what we found is that if they had the privacy meter, they actually would make different purchase decisions. And they'd actually pay about 50 cents more to shop at the websites that would protect their privacy according to this privacy meter. This is work that I did with um, Alessandro Acquisti and a bunch of students. Um, so Internet Explorer also uh, implemented P3P and uh, by default, if you never touched your privacy settings, which is like 99.999% of users, um, you actually have uh, P3P on in Internet Explorer. Actually, it's been that way since 2002. My understanding is that the new preview release of IE is the first IE since 2002 not to have P3P functionality. Um, so by default, it is using P3P to block third-party cookies. Um, and it, it was a pretty neat idea. It actually uh, was one of the reasons that a lot of companies adopted P3P. 
until they figured out that they could trick IE into not blocking their cookies without properly implementing P3P. Um, and, they, and basically due to a, a technical glitch in the way Microsoft implemented it. Um, and so essentially they were all lying about their privacy policies so that their cookies wouldn't get blocked. And Microsoft never changed the software and the Federal Trade Commission never went off, went, never went after any companies for doing this. And so that was kind of the end of P3P. Uh, so we heard this morning about the ad choices icon and I blew it up big so that you can actually see what it looks like. Um, and this is, you know, one of the best kept secrets on the internet. I've talked to many audiences about this icon and people swear to me they've never seen it. And then I say, well, just open your web browser and go to, you know, like the New York Times website and you see it. And they're like, well, it wasn't there yesterday. And no, it was. Um, <laughs> right? So it's been there for like five years now. Um, but nobody knows what it is. Um, and we made some claims about that and the ad industry said that we didn't know what we were talking about, just a bunch of researchers, academics, right? Um, so we did a study um, where we, we did an online survey of over a thousand people and we asked them, you know, what do you think would happen if you clicked on this? We asked them a bunch of other things too. All right, so 56% said more ads will pop up, which is wrong. 45% said it was kind of a your ad here sort of thing if you want to buy an ad. Only 27% correctly identified that it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Um, so it's really not communicating very well. Uh, we've also looked at um, uh, smartphone app privacy notices. And there's been a number of studies both at Carnegie Mellon and as well as other places that have found that people completely don't understand the permissions model um, that we have with app privacy notices. They don't understand what they mean. And you know, when they are installing apps, they're just like, click, 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 I want to get Angry Birds on my phone and start playing. And you know, they just accept everything. Um, so uh, there was a, a multi-stakeholder process a couple of years ago uh, done by the Department of Commerce and the NTIA, which was trying to come up with a short form privacy notice for apps. Um, and so uh, it took about a year to do this and they came up with seven data types and eight third party entities that should be part of this notice. Um, it didn't actually prescribe the visual format, but there were a number of members who came up with ideas, including one that looked something like this. Um, and so uh, we were watching that and one of my students um, tried to participate uh, in the process, mostly remotely, um, and we were somewhat perplexed that this um, group was coming up with ideas for a privacy notice and not involving any user testing at all. Um, it seemed like how, how do we know this is going to be useful if we don't actually test it with users. Uh, so we put together our own uh, kind of quick study, it cost less than $1,000 to do, um, where basically we gave people uh, descriptions of apps and then we tried to have them match the terminology used in these guidelines with the descriptions and try to see if they could figure out, um, you know, if, if this app says it's going to take a, a, a photo of your W-2 for tax purposes, what data type is that? Can you figure it out based on multiple choice questions? Um, we had four experts participate. These were people involved in the multi-stakeholder process. And we found that they agreed less than half the time. So we didn't actually know what the right answers were because we couldn't get our experts to agree. Um, among the random people who filled out our survey, we found um, that, that uh, it wasn't actually very often that we had high agreement there. For the most part, they were all over the place too. Um, we tried doing it both giving them the official definitions and not giving them the definitions. Um, we found that often the definitions helped, but sometimes they actually hurt things because the definitions confused people even more. Uh, so basically what we found was that, that um, people didn't really understand this notice. Um, and it's not really surprising because it was written by a bunch of lawyers and policy people. Um, and I think, I think this was a really good idea, but if you're going to try to come up with something useful to the average end user, I think it's important to have a process that actually involves end users and involves um, user testing as an integral part of the process. Um, Another issue with these notices is when do you show them? Uh, the obvious time to show a notice is before a user downloads an app. 
Um, but we actually see that that's not necessarily the time when the user is going to be most likely to pay attention to it because it's this, I'm just eager to get it and try it out, and they're not necessarily focused on that kind of you know, fine print detail at that point. So we did a study where we made up an app. It was about it was a U.S. Uh, history quiz, and we um, paid people to test our app. Uh, we didn't tell them that we were interested in the privacy notice. We said we were testing this new history quiz app, and we had different versions of the app that put the privacy notice in different places. Uh, and we we used a notice that was based on this NTIA privacy notice. So some people saw it only in the app store. Some people saw it uh, after they downloaded the app. Some saw it in the middle of the quiz, it would pop up, and some saw it at the end of the quiz after they finished taking the quiz. And we then um, asked them questions about how much they liked the app and what color it was and things like that. And then we also asked them about what kinds of data this app was collecting. And what we found was that um, the people who saw the privacy notice in the app store uh, basically didn't remember it at all. They, they were no different than the people who weren't shown the privacy notice. But if you showed them the privacy notice during the playing of the, of the app or at the end, then um, a lot of them actually did remember information from the privacy notice. Um, so this suggests that the timing is really important. Now, I don't think we should remove the privacy notice from having it available in advance because some people do want to see it in advance, but I think that shows that that may not be sufficient. We have another project going on right now at CMU um, where we're trying to um, extract information from privacy policies automatically. So, you know, P3P didn't work out. We couldn't get companies to provide the computer readable data. So, can we have computers go and read English language privacy policies and extract useful information, which we could then uh, pro provide to people in formats like Privacy Bird or new um, tools that might uh, show people useful information. Um, so this is something that's in progress, um, and one of the um, one of the th problems that we've run into is that it's actually hard for humans, even human experts, sometimes to extract this information. Uh, so we did a, um, a study where we paid people on Mechanical Turk to try to get information, and their answers were all over the place. So then we paid law students to do it and their answers were all over the place. And so then we got law professors to do it, and they were really only slightly better. Um, and so the fundamental problem is that a lot of these privacy policies are just kind of ambiguous, and it's often hard to extract that information. But to the extent that they actually are clear, we are making some progress in being able to automate that extraction. Um, one area where it's easy to automate the extraction is the financial privacy notices, and that's because they're all in this standard tabular format. And so we wrote computer scripts that will go and actually get that information out of these tables. These are not computer readable, they're, they're actually PDF files, but we're able to, with reasonable accuracy, get this out of the tables, um, despite the fact that there are a lot of typos and spelling errors and things like that in the tables, it turns out. Um, so we were able to do that for about 6,000 banks in the US, and we have a website where we've put our whole database of privacy policy information for US banks, and you can search for banks and compare them. Um, and right now, it, it's still pretty basic, but we have a lot of ideas of how to actually make you know, useful use of this information for consumers. Um, we also have a paper where we did a regression analysis, and we were able to see that things like the size of the holdings of the bank, um, it, you know, the bigger the bank, the worse their privacy policy tends to be for consumers. Um, so a lot of interesting data there. All right, finally, um, another approach to adding technology to enhance privacy is the privacy nudges, which has been alluded to um, uh, earlier today. And so we have a privacy nudging project at CMU, um, and we've been focusing most of our um, privacy nudging on social networks. So how can we nudge users to protect their own privacy on social networks? Um, so we started out by trying to figure out what we should nudge them about, and so we did studies on what they regret doing on Facebook and Twitter, which is fascinating. Um, and then um, we, were, we, we looked at um, trying to figure out what types of nudges would be effective, and then we prototyped some nudges. Um, so we came up with three uh, types of nudges that seemed like they would be useful based on the things people regretted. So people tend to post without thinking, a very common 
uh, cause of regrets. So we wanted to encourage people to stop and think. Um, people tend to misread how other people are going to perceive their posts. And so we wanted um, nudges that would help make them more aware of that. And we also found that people forgot who was in their audience. They forgot that their boss, their mother, their ex-girlfriend were in the audience of their post because they were still their friends on Facebook. So for example, this is a nudge that we developed that has a countdown timer. So as you're posting, um, you click post and then you have 10 seconds before it's really posted. Um, and we did a study where, where we actually um, enhanced people's Facebook experience with this. And um, while, while a few people found it annoying because they just like wanted to get on with it, a lot of people said it did help them reflect on what they were doing and, it, and we, had, we collected data where we showed people were actually going back and changing some of the things they were posting. Um, we also had uh, one we called our sentiment nudge that did some very uh, simple um, computerized analysis of whether your post was generally positive or negative. Um, this was kind of a flop, uh, in part because I think our analysis was too simple. It didn't get sarcasm, for example. Um, and people, people actually di really didn't like it when, when it missed their sarcasm. But also people would say, um, all right, you're telling me that my post is negative. Well, damn right it's negative, I'm mad, right? So it didn't, it didn't really help all that much. Um, our third nudge, which was actually pretty su successful, is that every time you start typing a post, we randomly select five people who are going to see that post and show you their profile pictures. And so every time you post, it's a different random set of people. And that kind of reminded people of who was seeing their posts. And I know I was using this for a while, and whenever my grandmother's picture popped up there, you know, I would like stop and rethink what I was posting. So it was, it was pretty effective. Um, all right, so we did a bunch of, of uh, trials on this, and, um, and as I said, it seemed like th these are some promising directions here, um, and uh, we, we actually showed these to Facebook, and some of the things that they're doing now with the privacy dinosaur, they said, were actually inspired by, by some of the work that we did on this. So, all right, so I will wrap it up here, and uh, you know, my, my main, main point here is, is just to kind of show you there are a bunch of, bunch of ideas, bunch of directions you could go in, um, but I don't think that any of these are a silver bullet that's going to solve all our problems. Thank you very much. Uh, NCIA was mentioned. John Sweeney, <laughs> it's Tom Brady, and uh, you know, uh, talk with us uh, about his uh, take on this problem. It, it, it's almost like you say my name three times and I show up. I'm like Candyman. Um, oh. So. <laughs> So, um, Lori, thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much. And, and thank you, folks, for having me here today. So, um, I, I, first of all, I'm going to endeavor, because this is the last panel of the day and I'm standing in between folks and, and cocktails, I'm going to endeavor to come in under time, um, also so we can have some time for, some additional time for Q&A. Um, first of all, let me just sort of frame the NTIA process a little bit. Um, we undertook that process to bring together a, a diverse group of folks from industry, from civil society, from the academic community, um, and from the technical community to try to get folks to focus on this one particular uh, privacy problem um, and how to enhance users' experiences on mobile devices, how folks can be, be better presented with notices on very small screens that can convey information very quickly, because I think one of the previous uh, presentations we saw today um, dis uh, demonstrated just how quickly users tap through these things, especially on mobile devices. So um, NTIA in this process worked as a facilitator and as a convener. We don't have rulemaking authority in the area, and, and we weren't really asking industry or advocates or academics for advice on what NTIA should do. Instead, what we were doing was bringing folks together to find out what whether or not the group could make progress on, on this issue. And I think that they did. Um, now, I don't think that this was a perfect solution. Um, I, I, I would sort of harken back to something Peter Swire said earlier, which is um, when folks get together to try to make progress on these issues, whether it's on do not track or whether it's on mobile notices, any of these privacy enhancing technologies, um, it, the question isn't whether or not the technology is going to be perfect, whether or not it's gonna solve all the privacy problems that it set out to solve but is it better than the status quo? Does it move the ball forward for users? Um, so what happened in our process was that um, industry and advocates and others came together and they set a couple of priorities, they had some discussions and they focused on a couple of different factors, right? 
And I think it's helpful to maybe talk a little bit about why they focused on what they did. Ultimately, as Lori said, um, they came up with a code of conduct for um, short form notices that companies can implement in a variety of different ways. And it's intended to convey some pretty basic information about what information mobile apps collect about users and with whom they share it. Um, as we all know, those are two really broad categories. And we, and we just had a panel that discussed how detailed some of these long form privacy notices can be. Um, it's impossible to present those complexities on a small screen. So what the group decided to do was try to identify the categories of data and the entities with whom that data might be shared that are top of mind or most important for users. You know, categories of data like location data that a lot of users think is super sensitive on mobile devices. Biometric information, right, um, that folks think is super sensitive across platforms. Whether or not that data is sha shared with advertisers, the government, carriers, things like that. Um, and the focus was not on providing a comprehensive notice about all the data that apps collect or everyone with whom the apps share that data. Rather, it was designed to display the most salient, salient information to users um, as far as the group could figure that out. Now, one of the things this does is it reduces the comprehensiveness, but it potentially vastly increases the understandability of this. Um, so then the question is why don't all users and why don't all experts um, perfectly understand exactly what the notice is conveying in all circumstances? And the answer to that is uh, we had a number of folks from industry and a number of folks from civil society talk about the challenges um, whenever you present any kind of new notice to users, whether it's a privacy notice, whether it's another sort of notice, um, users are inevitably going to be imperfectly informed by these notices. There's no question about that. Um, there's also no question that if these notices are iterated over time, if they evolve or, over time in response to the user experience, that it's possible for app developers and others to improve the notices and, and to, to improve how effective they are. Um, it's also true, um, as far as folks in the group were concerned, um, that if the notices as originally crafted are pretty good, um, that even if that iteration, even if that improvement doesn't happen, the simple um, factor of familiarity with the notices will improve recognition and, and how well these notices inform folks over time. So recognizing those things, the group did not spend um, you know, all of its resources trying to get the notices perfect at the outset. What they did was they tried to get a group of notices that they believed to be top of mind um, and that they believed to be applicable across the mobile app ecosystem, you know, across apps that dealt with health data, that dealt with location data, that came from operating system providers, that came from carriers, that came from third party app developers, that came from really big companies, that came from really small companies, that came from individuals who weren't companies at all. Um, they wanted to make sure that the notice was flexible enough to apply in all the circumstances. And they wanted to make sure that the notice was standardized. So that, you know, we heard some discussion of intermediaries potentially playing a role here um, or earlier in the discussion. Uh, we also saw um, in, in Professor Craner's presentation um, some of the work that can be done when you have standardized formats and you have machine readable data. Um, this it can uh, promote research, it can promote um, enforcement entities to compare across apps. It can also make it a lot easier for individual users, even if they're not using technological means, if they're just using visual means to compare things. Oh, look at this app, it collects this amount of data. Look at this other app, it collects um, substantially less data. That um, is something that the group was very concerned about and it really wanted to provide a structure for. Um, so those were kind of the priorities of the group. Um, the group, I think, made progress on these sorts of notices and we've had you know, pretty good uptake from app developers and trade associations. Folks have made um, open source code, computer code available so that any small individual app developer can build these notices into a mobile app um, without investing engineering resources into it. Um, we've had big companies like Microsoft adopt. We've had companies like Intuit that deal with tax information and financial information adopt. Um, and ultimately, this group um, you know, focused on a particular task and, and what they wanted to do is move the ball forward and improve the situation. Um, I think that, that there's certainly 
um, a, a critique to be had over whether or not it is the optimal result for these folks to proceed in this manner. But um, I also think it's a pretty incredible thing for big companies like Google and Facebook um, and Microsoft to come into a room with very small app developers and civil society and academics and technical experts and hash out a conversation about what um, short form privacy notices look like and how you can improve the user experience. The other thing I want to note is that the group was very much aware that these notices um, do not exist in a vacuum. So the group was not attempting to provide comprehensive um, one-size-fits-all notices that, that would provide users with all of the information about privacy and data collection practices. Instead, they were trying to come up with notices that app developers could implement um, as part of a layered approach, as part of an approach that recognized the sorts of notices that the app stores, um, the Android app store and the iOS app store already provide. Um, it acknowledged some of the just-in-time notices that mobile operating systems provide as a matter of course. Um, it also worked in recognition and within the context of the long-form privacy policies that companies publish. So the idea here was not to be a one-size-fits-all solution, but the idea was to try to fill some of the gaps between the highly technical, highly legalistic, um, long-form notices that companies provide on websites, for example, and sometimes within an app. Um, the app store notices, which are necessarily incomplete, but provide certain very specific information, depending on the OS. Um, and then the just-in-time notices that the OSs provide as individuals move through the app experience and use the app. So that's what the group was able to do. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that I, I think they moved the ball forward. Um, and we're also very pleased that this sort of process, you know, convening a, a you know, 11 or 12 month process of industry and civil society and, and other folks um, is something that can be revisited as companies roll this out, as companies iterate this, as um, trade associations provide open source code and small app providers pick it up and use it. Um, this is something that can be revisited in the future um, in a way that legislation and regulation is very difficult to revisit and there are much longer timelines. So happy to take questions when it's appropriate and I will uh, cede the rest of my time either to the group getting cocktails or to Q&A. Sean, thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Roger Dingledine from Tor, and I'm going to smash together too many different types of talks uh, into my 10 or 15 minutes and try to give you a taste of, of lots of different things. So Tor is a uh, program that you can install on your computer, and the idea is that you can browse the web uh, or you can connect to other services, and somebody watching you locally can't figure out what sites you're going to, and somebody at the website end can't figure out where you're coming from. So uh, it's open source software. It's also a network of volunteers running relays around the world. We have about 7,000 volunteers. Uh, it's also a protocol. I'm going to leave off the science part and talk more about the, the social value side for today. One of the other fun things of Tor is the community of researchers and developers and activists all around the world. Basically, every city I go to these days has a graduate student writing some research paper about Tor. So there's always a professor who says, hey, Roger, I really want to come, want you to come uh, teach my students what the open research questions are so that you can uh, help my papers be more useful. Uh, another fun part of Tor is the diversity of funders we've had. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear this word diversity come up again and again in this talk. Uh, it's really useful that we have funding from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Google and the US State Department because they care about these things for different reasons. We're also a US 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, my goal is to uh, A, build software to keep everybody in the world safe on the internet for all definitions of safe. And once I'm done with that, I would like to teach everybody what it means to be safe and how to have the right intuition on these things and how to evaluate software. 
So we have some number of users. It's an anonymity system, so it's a bit hard to tell for sure. But there are something like two million people using Tor uh, today. And that number uh, of people is really important. This morning we heard Hal Varian talking about how uh, there's an adverse selection process where admitting that you're interested in anonymity uh, is by itself perhaps dangerous. So it's really critical to have millions of people using Tor every day. Uh, and most of them are ordinary people who uh, just read about some corporation losing its database of users or they just read about surveillance or they're in Syria and they don't want to uh, be censored. Okay, so from a computer science perspective, uh, what's our threat model? What are we actually worried about? Where can the attacker attack this? So we have Alice over here, she's some user, she's trying to get to Bob, some website somewhere in the world. Where can the adversary be? Where, where can they watch traffic on the internet? So one answer is they're watching Alice's local network connection. So maybe this is Comcast trying to spy on its users to sell data, uh, or maybe it's the monopoly telephone company in Tunisia that monitors everything. Uh, or maybe the adversary is on the Bob end, maybe they're watching indiemedia.org or WikiLeaks to try to figure out uh, who, what users in the world are going there. Uh, or maybe the adversary is Bob. Maybe it's CNN.com and they want to know who their users are so they can advertise to them better. Uh, or maybe the adversary's in the middle of the network, AT&T uh, and thus NSA or a bunch of other large surveillance adversaries. No video input, please check cable. So far so good, well, I can see it up there, great. Um, Okay, so another key thing that we have to keep in mind, anonymity is not just crypto. I talk to a lot of corporations who say, uh, well, yeah, I don't need Tor because I use a VPN, so I'm all set, thanks. Encryption is good, you should use encryption, but even when you're using encryption, somebody watching your network traffic gets to learn who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking, and that's actually what all the intelligence agencies and corporations uh, use these days. Nobody actually tries to break the encryption. It's all about let's build a social graph of who's talking to who, let's find out who's in the middle of the social graph, and now we'll break into their house and install something on their laptop or something like that. Okay, so there are some other variations. Um, there's the more common uh, de plausible deniability notion where, yeah, there were you know eight different bloggers in Saudi Arabia and you can't prove which one of us it is, so, so no problem, we're all, you know, we'll all be fine. Uh, and maybe there are some legal jurisdictions where that works, but I wouldn't want to be any of those eight bloggers in Saudi Arabia each saying, well, you can't prove it was me. Uh, and then there are some other variations. There are a bunch of uh, for-profit uh, anonymizing companies out there that say, uh, I promise I won't look at any of the traffic. Okay, actually I, I look at all the traffic, but I promise I won't write anything down. I won't log anything. Okay, actually I, I log everything, but I promise I won't tell anybody what you're doing. I don't know what the fourth line is, but I want something that's stronger uh, than ju just these promises. So long ago, I was talking to the CTO of anonymizer.com, and he said, we never answer subpoenas. If we ever answered a subpoena, nobody would trust us again. So of course we never answer subpoenas. Uh, and then I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice, and they interrupted me and said, why can't you be like anonymizer? It's easy, we send them a subpoena, they send us an answer, it's easy. Why can't you be like that? So I, I don't mean to say that that particular company is dangerous. I mean to show that this privacy by policy or privacy by promise approach where they have all the data, it's all centralized, they could screw you, they know it's you and they know you looked at this page and they promise not to reveal it, that by itself, that architecture is dangerous because they know everything and you have to trust them that their business model won't change, that they don't screw up, that they didn't decide to lie to you. Um, and there are a lot of problems from that that we'll get talk about in a bit. So I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers. There's a field called anonymous communications research. When I'm talking to my parents, I tell them I'm working on privacy systems because anonymity is a little bit, I'm not sure, but privacy is a good American value. When I'm talking to corporations, Google and Walmart and so on, I work on communication security or network security because uh, privacy is dead. I think the Oracle person told me that. Um, but an anonymity, why would I need that? I'm a company, but uh, I want to be able to check out what my competitors are doing. I want to, uh, you know, the CEO of Microsoft is 
talking to the CEO of Apple this week. Uh, is that the sort of thing that they want to be revealing? Um, and then when I'm talking to governments and militaries, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And it's, again, it's all the same security properties. It's all the same system. And all the users have to blend into the same system in order to, to blur together. You can't have an anonymity system for cancer survivors where everybody who installs it, you know why they installed it. We need this diversity of users to protect everybody. And then there's a fourth category that I'm mostly going to skip over today, which are the uh, human rights activists who are censored or surveilled uh, in some country, uh, and they want to be able to reach BBC safely. Okay, and yes, there are bad people on the internet, and they also need anonymity or privacy or security. Uh, I'm going to skip over that and happy to chat about it later. Uh, the very short answer is the bad people on the internet are doing great. I get spam every day from computers that have been compromised by uh, jerks in Russia, uh, and there's nothing that the policy side or even the technical side is doing about that. Okay, so how do you actually build one of these? The easy answer is you put some computer somewhere in some centralized place and all the users uh, ask it to proxy their requests and it goes and fetches the website and gives it back. Um, and that's great, except what about that central point of failure I was just talking about where that centralized uh, company, they get to learn all the users and they get to learn everything the users are doing uh, and then you have, to pr you have to trust them that they're not gonna decide to publish your information or profit from it in some way. It's actually worse than that. Uh, if I can see the internet connections going into that proxy company, and it's the same internet co connection coming back out, I can see all the traffic flows going in, all the traffic flows going out, and statistics lets me match them up to say this user was fetching this web page. So even if the centralized company is totally honest and they really are trying to do the right thing, there's one point on the internet that lets you totally defeat the system. So uh, you, we have to assume, and we've even seen documents, that FBI and uh, German law enforcement and all sorts of different groups out there uh, regularly tap these uh, VPN tools or uh, proxy tools in order to learn all of their users and what all their users are doing. So the goal of Tor is to distribute the trust over multiple volunteer relays all around the world so that no single relay gets to know about both where you are and where you're going. So that means if R1, if the first relay that you connect to, if, the, if, if R1 is bad, he knows that you're using Tor, but he doesn't know what you're doing with Tor. And if R3 is bad, he knows somebody is connecting to CNN.com, but he doesn't know who is connecting to CNN.com. And if they're both bad, uh, then one of them gets to see one side of the traffic and the other one gets to see the corresponding other side of the traffic. And if they collaborate, then they could link them up. So Tor isn't perfect, but it distributes the trust so there's no longer a single central place that gets to learn about both who you are and what you're doing. And there's crypto, I'm gonna skip over that. Okay, so we have about 7,000 volunteer relays out there right now all around the world, uh, but the, uh, the, the question is not how many relays there are, the question is how much capacity there is because we have millions of users who are all trying to browse the web or watch YouTube or whatever they're trying to do. Uh, and so right now we have something like uh, 12 gigabytes per second of capacity. I remember chatting with the Akamai people a few years ago who were reminiscing about the time that uh, the Akamai network was about this size. So we're maybe eight years behind uh, Akamai in terms of volume, but we're comparable to Wikipedia in terms of the, the amount of traffic that we push on the internet. Uh, and the other, uh, so the, there are two pieces of Tor's anonymity or privacy or security, uh, and they really come down to diversity. So the first piece is where on the internet are these 7,000 relays compared to where the adversaries are who might be trying to watch things. So if I had a 7,000 relay Tor network all running at Yale University, then it wouldn't be as diverse because anybody watching Yale University gets to see all the connections. So it, it's really critical that we have a lot of relays uh, around the US and around Europe and in other countries and continents besides those. So that's the first piece of diversity. It's where are the relays located? And the second piece of diversity has to do with what type of users we have. So for example, in Iran, uh, the first thing you might think would be, oh man, it's really dangerous to use something like Tor in Iran 
Iran because as soon as they see that you have Torah, they know that you're a dissident and they'll just arrest you, right? Uh, so it, it's really important that, uh, first of all, that we have 50,000 or 100,000 people every day using Torah in Iran. Uh, but second, it's really important that the average Torah user in Iran is just using it to get to Facebook because the censors blocked Facebook and I need to watch my, you know, my cat comic or whatever it is that I do on the internet. Uh, so the average user there of Torah is an ordinary person, which means when you find somebody in Iran who has Torah installed, you can't jump to conclusions about why they have Torah installed. Okay, um, so the Tor browser is one of the ways that you can get and use Tor. Everything I've been talking so far is uh, at the network layer where it hides your IP address or it hides what website you go to. There's a completely separate talk which is uh, all of the web browser style stuff. So we talked early this morning about cookies and things like that. Uh, it turns out there's a list of literally hundreds of ways that your web browser can give away information about you or let you be tracked. And that's totally separate from Tor. Tor would be doing its job. Nobody knows where you are, but the website you go to can say, hey, what time zone do you think it is? And your browser will just turn that over. Or it can say, hey, here's a cookie, give me the cookie back. Or it can say, hey, can you tell me how many pixels by how many pixels your web browsing window is? Or can you tell me all the fonts that are installed on the computer right now? So that's a, a totally separate talk, but a, a really important one. Um, I was talking to Chris about this uh, earlier. He uh, wanted me to discuss a little bit the, uh, the challenge with fixing all of the privacy bugs in browsers like Firefox. So we've basically forked Firefox into our own version called the Tor browser that fixes a bunch of what we consider to be critical privacy bugs in Firefox. And we told Mozilla about them. And mostly they say, yeah, I can see why you'd be concerned about that, but I, I don't, you know, low, low priority for us. And that's better than the Chrome answer. The Chrome answer is, look, there's this other bug that's still a problem. So why should we fix this one? And then they close the ticket with won't fix. Uh, so there's a, a lot of incentives problems out there for the browser vendors to even consider these uh, tracking things to be bugs in the first place. Okay, so uh, there's another version uh, of Tor called Orbot that you can get on your Android. Uh, and another way of uh, installing it is the Tails. Uh, Debian and Tor and everything you want pre-configured uh, on your USB key or your CD or something like that. So you basically pop it in, you boot a separate operating system that has all the applications that you should want pre-configured and it's missing all the really dangerous oper uh, applications like Microsoft Word that you probably shouldn't want um, and uh, a bunch of quite famous journalists who have been handling the Snowden slides and so on uh, only use Tails for doing that because they know they have uh, real surveillance-oriented adversaries and they want to be protected uh, not just by what Tor gives them, protecting their traffic, but also the, the whole operating system they're using. Okay, and then there's another talk that I'm not going to get into, which is internet censorship. Here's a fun graph from a few years ago uh, of the number of Tor users over time in Egypt. So you can see when Egypt blocks Facebook, that's when the number spikes, and you can see when Egypt turns off the internet, that's when the number flatlines. Uh, my favorite part of this graph is the number of users afterwards is twice the number of users before. So there are a lot of people who are saying, uh, yeah, actually that whole revolution thing isn't finished and the whole surveillance infrastructure that the military has in place is still going. I know they're still watching. Uh, of course, I'm gonna try to have some more protection. Okay, uh, other excitement. Uh, you may recognize this picture. It was on the news uh, rather a lot a year or so ago. Um, and there's this really cool Tor sticker up there. So Ed uh, made use of Tor in order to safely be able to uh, do the whistleblowing activities that he was doing. Uh, so there are a lot of discussions we can have uh, about uh, the national security side. Here's a great quote from uh, either NSA or GCHQ about Tor. I'm not sure which. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who have clearances here, but this is a, a published document at this point. Uh, so there are a couple of interesting things to think about. Uh, one of them is, at least from what we can tell from the NSA documents, uh, they're pretty far uh, from being able to break the, the Tor design. Some of their documents talked about 
uh, using exploits in Firefox in order to attack Tor users. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of different pieces we have to solve at once. There's another interesting uh, piece to the whole NSA discussion. Uh, from a technical side, there are a bunch of people in anonymous communications research, and what we want to do is build a technical tool that means it doesn't matter if the laws or the policies break down. We give people tools that they can use to choose whether they want to reveal information to websites, and it shouldn't be about uh, whether the U.S. follows its policies or whether, uh, whether laws uh, allow or disallow something. Uh, so in theory, I'd like to build a tool that just makes everything work for you technically. One of the realizations we've had over the past year, uh, if there is a uh, NSA plus England plus Germany and so on adversary out there, and if the NSA is actually uh, either not following laws or follow its, following its own secret laws, uh, there's no way that we can build technology that defends you against this unbounded adversary. So one of the things that we in the technical world have been coming to grips with is uh, we really need from the policy and law side, we need people to constrain these adversaries so they stop watching the entire internet uh, illegally or immorally or that, that's a separate talk that we should get into. Okay, and then uh, the last thing, I'm I think running out of time, so uh, an important thing to keep in mind here is Tor does not solve all of the, the pieces that you might want. Uh, for example, um, if you are running spyware, uh, we're not going to be able to solve that for you. If there is a camera watching your screen, I hear there's a law in Beijing that says you need a camera watching the screen of everybody in internet cafes. So if there's something watching your screen, Tor is not going to solve that problem for you. Now in this particular case, I'm told that the first person who walks into the internet cafe in the morning reaches up and turns the camera away and nobody ever turns it back, so no problem. Um, Another uh, really scary version of that, I was talking to a bunch of activists in Vietnam long ago and uh, they gave me a, a Windows computer that uh, they were pretty sure was compromised in some way because there were seven activists and one of them sent uh, PGP encrypted mail to the other six and the plain text of that mail got published in the national newspaper the next morning and they were all trying to figure out is there a mole, does PGP not work, did they break into my computer, what, what's going on here? Uh, and it turns out the answer is uh, there is no Vietnamese keyboard driver support on Windows by default. So as soon as you get Windows, you go to the website that everybody goes to to install Vietnamese support for Windows, which the Vietnamese Secret Service has backdoored. So every single person using Windows with Vietnamese support is being monitored by the Vietnamese Secret Service so thoroughly that they can publish your mail the next morning in the newspaper. So if you're in that sort of situation, uh, Tor is a good start, but it's certainly not going to solve all of the problems. So hopefully that was a, a good overview of some of the discussions we can have in the panel. Wonderful, Roger. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll ask a few questions and then turn it over to the audience because I think we could get a lot of energy out of the audience on this. So, Laurie, you know, one of, one of the most interesting questions is um, how you find the incentives to get this kind of technology out there because, you know, it seemed that whatever incentive you created for the, um, the privacy language uh, worked for a while, right? I mean, you know, so, so Microsoft buying into something and, you know, spending coders on it, that, that's an achievement, right? So what do you think the challenge is right now for some of these technologies which seem, you know, not particularly uh, dangerous or... Uh, terribly technically hard to implement. It's just, what, what, what do you think is the solution to traction? Yeah, I, I think incentives have been a huge problem and it has really plagued all of these technologies and continues to plague do not track, which we don't have because I think we don't have the incentives for the parties to come together and actually finish the job, which they've been doing for several years now. Um, and I think we've seen a pattern where there's a threat of regulation 
and companies say, no, we don't want to be regulated. We want to self-regulate and solve this problem ourselves. And they start working on solving the problem, and the regulators go and look at something else. And as soon as the companies realize that the regulators aren't paying close attention anymore, they lose interest and, and you lack the incentives. And I think if you really want these things to work, the regulators can't turn their backs. They have to stay on top of them, and maybe we actually need a law. I mean, there's been talk of saying that there's a, that we need a law for do not track. Um, I don't think do not track will happen unless we actually have a law that says that companies have to do this. And I think with P3P, um, had we had a requirement for computer readable privacy policies, then perhaps we, we could have had the incentives for it to work. Um, the reason that Microsoft actually implemented it was because the state attorney generals were on their backs about third party cookies and, and their practices there. Um, I believe the, the state AGs had suggested to them that their browser just block all third party cookies. That wasn't a palatable solution to them. And so Bill Gates said, okay, we're gonna implement P3P so we give users that control. Um, this was a surprise to all the developers at Microsoft uh, who were somewhat panicked by that and came to the P3P working group and said, you need to dumb P3P down so that we can implement it quickly. But we, we came up with a shortcut for them. They implemented it. They did that rough draft. We pointed out the problems, and by then, you know, Bill Gates was able to take credit for having done that implementation. The state AGs went away, and so they never had the incentive to actually fix the bugs in it. Thank you. Uh, John, I had a question for you. Um, do you think the mobile space is deeply different? You know, you spoke a little bit about mobiles and, uh, you know, talking about the information that was given on the small screen and things like that. Do you think that that's a different space or, you know, it was just an instance that you were talking about um, of uh, a constrained environment? That sure. So, so, I, so I think it's probably different in two ways, right? Um, first of all, it's different in terms of screen real estate. And, and the reality is when you look at, at privacy notices, not at controls, not at security practices, not at accountability mechanisms, things like that, but when you actually look at privacy notices, um, users are not going to scroll, they're not going to click, um, they are going to glance, and we had a number of folks in, uh, from industry in the process who talked about glanceability. And, and they basically said, for their own controls for the functionality of the app, right? Not a privacy notice, but just the, the baseline functionality of the app. So you know the user wants to use the app. That's why they turned on the app. You know the user wants to use the particular functionality, the search box or the, or the um, communications um, uh, functionality or whatever it is. Um, they will still bail on the app if it's not glanceable, if it's not immediately obvious. So I think in that respect, it's a little bit different than the desktop experience. The second way in which it's different is, um, you know, we can, t we can have discussions and, and the folks in the group had discussions about what qualified as a mobile device and what qualified as not a mobile device. Um, there are some edge cases, but the truth of the matter is a desktop computer with a 30 inch monitor is not a mobile device unless you're very, very strong <laughs> and very, very nerdy. I mean, it's just, it, you're not going to walk around with those things under your arms. Um, and your iPhone is a mobile device, regardless of whether or not it just sort of sits on your desk and then goes you know, on the subway with you and then ends up in your home. It doesn't travel that much, but it is in fact a mobile device that you carry around, right? So edge cases aside, um, you can kind of figure out what's a mobile device and what's not. And the second way in which that space is different is that these mobile devices collect locational information and other contextual information that is different either in degree or in kind from what um, apps, either web-based apps or native apps get in the desktop space and the non-mobile space. So I think those are the two ways um, that, that it's distinct and I think that those are two of the things that were top of mind for folks as they kind of try to tackle this problem. I, I mean, uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, perfectly. I mean, the, the reason that I asked is that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of of the belief as probably everyone is that, um, you know, you're seeing this new architecture where people have small devices that are personal, they carry with them everywhere so they're always able to access information and all the stuff that we used to do with server rooms years ago is now done by Amazon or Google or Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, the cloud has 
got a lot of offerings in terms of once you can reach the internet, um, you know, the mobile device is actually a very good choice, iPad type devices and Android phones. I mean, you know, you know, it's, it changes your whole model of information access. So the point that you made resonated with me as a threat, you know, about, about notice. Um, sure. You guys do a lot of studies. Um, let me, do, do, Lori talked a lot about studies that Carnegie Mellon did with, um, uh, you know, say Amazon Mechanical Turk and things like that. D does NTIA do s s sort of scientific evaluation? Is that part of your role? So, so no, it's not. So we, um, our friends at NIST within the Department of Commerce do a lot more scientific evaluation and standard setting. At NTIA, we work on the policy issues. And, and in fact, um, you know, in the group uh, that we convened, we encouraged folks to do usability studies. And there were folks within the group who felt passionately that it was important to do usability studies. As a facilitator, you know, I, I can say that we bumped into two problems w within that. Um, there was, I think, pretty widespread agreement that um, doing usability studies would be helpful. Some folks felt more passionately about it than others, but by and large, folks thought it was helpful and, and were positive about it. Um, ran into two bumps in the road. They, they were kind of minor bumps. One is that no one in the group could agree on what to test. And the second one is that no one in the group could agree on what to do with the test results. And when you have those two minor hurdles, um, you don't have a really strong basis for a usability testing framework, right? Um, and I think that when groups get together, you know, as Lori has done w with her students multiple times in, in a number of different contexts, and folks agree on what they're testing, and they agree what uh, on what they're going to do with the results, it can be a super helpful thing. Um, the problem is if you don't agree on those things, testing is essentially a fool's errand, right? Because it, you, you can't get agreement on what to test, you can't get agreement on what to do with it, well then what are you doing, right? And, and we, we urged folks to agree on those things so that they could move forward, and they, they just weren't able to get that, get to consensus on it. So I, I think that actually points to a fundamental problem, though, that you had with the process, is that you couldn't agree on what the goals were. If you knew what the goal of the process was, then what you would test is you would evaluate how effective you were at achieving your goals. But since different stakeholders had different ideas about what the goal was, that's why they couldn't agree on what to test. Yeah, so, so, so I agree with you. I, I, I agree with, um, with the latter characterization, which is that I think different, I don't think that folks didn't know what their goals were. But they, they I, I think that folks disagreed <laughs> yes, about what yes. their goals were. So yes, so yes there, there was not, NTIA did not sit kind of at the top of the pyramid in that process and say, the goals for usability are X, and this group needs to go forward on doing that. Um, you know, there are entities, you know, NIST sets their own research agenda. So if they decide they want to pursue research on a particular topic, they go out and they sort of pursue research on that topic. We have a slightly different model, which is we're trying to facilitate agreement within a broader group and if those folks don't agree on what their goals are, um, they can still make progress, but, but, but they're gonna be limited in what the tools are in their toolkit. Thanks, that's great. Roger, you know, a very interesting word that you brought up uh, in the talk was di diversity. And so I was listening to your technological description and, um, you know, there seem to be three pieces. There's, there's somebody who wants to use Tor. There's the internals of the network, the, the relays, and somebody has to run those. And then there's the exit node where, you know, there's traffic that, that uh, is moving in and out into the, uh, into the Tor system. Um, where do you think that, you know, given the state of Tor, uh, the greatest pressure is on the system. Where would you want more, you know, if you've got two million users, I, I don't think you've got two million exit nodes. So is the exit node the, the major constraint? 
Yeah, so this ties into the capacity stuff we were talking about before. Um, we've got two million users using the network right now and it's not as fast as it could be if we had more relays offering more capacity. Uh, so uh, given that you generally hop through three relays, we need about a third of those relays to be willing to be exit relays. So the difference between a normal relay and an exit relay, uh, the exit relay has, have basically said, I'm willing to let people reach uh, websites and other services from me. Plenty of people sign up Tor relays and just say, look, I want to connect Tor users to other Tor relays and I never want to be that last hop where the website's going to be confused about, uh, about whether I'm the origin of that traffic or what this Tor thing is. Uh, so we have uh, about a third of the network by capacity is exit relays right now. So uh, it, it works, there's enough, but let's tie that back to the diversity side. The more relays we have at that third hop, the more diversity of possible uh, places you're going to use to go to the website you're going to. So ideally we would have uh, a huge amount of diversity at the exit point of the network and a huge amount of diversity at the entry point of the network. So it's really hard to predict uh, where you're going to connect to the Tor network and where you're going to leave the Tor network. So we need uh, more diversity and more relays and more volunteers in, in all ways. One quick follow on and then, then we'll go to audi audience questions. Um, what kind of event, so your graph was fascinating uh, in the Egypt situation because you knew what event um, caused that very interesting phenomenology that impulse function up and the impulse function down and then the, you know, the increase later. Uh, what kind of event do you think could trigger doubling, um, you know, people contributing exit relays to your pool of technology? Well, periodically this actually happens. So in the Arab Spring, for example, when a lot of people were talking about Tunisia, there were a lot of people around the world saying, hey, this is really important, I want to help uh, people in this country be able to get uh, out of the censorship and surveillance that's happening. And that happened in Tunisia, it happened in Egypt, it happened in Iran, it's still going on in Syria and Iran and Egypt and, and all of them. Uh, so there are a bunch of uh, actual events that happened. Turkey was one of these just uh, a week ago. Uh, the Turkish authorities decided to start censoring uh, YouTube and a lot of other things. Um, and there are now tens of thousands of people in Turkey who are using Tor, among other things, to get around that censorship. So these events do happen, but let me follow that up with, uh, please in the audience do not say to yourself, oh thank God I don't live in one of those countries. Because one of the problems that we have in general is people say, oh Tunisia, that's a bad place, of course censorship happens there, of course surveillance happens there, I'll just not go to Tunisia and then I'll be fine. So part of what we uh, need to, to teach people about is that this is a global issue where uh, a lot of people need to care about it for a lot of different reasons. Good, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, Helen? Can we get a microphone? I apologize, I came in late for this, so I hope it wasn't covered. I have two quick questions, um, one for John and one for Roger, and in a way, informational. Um, because I remember participating at the beginning of the multi-stakeholder process and I realized I just couldn't keep up and many of the people there had dedicated, paid, employers who would who would and could attend. So I think the intention of the process was really good and well-meaning, but what happens then in the end is that you have a tiny little fraction of, of people who are not representing industry in, interests. And so, I mean, the, the, so in what sense is it multi-stakeholder representing all the stakeholders, and don't you think that's what government, it's not right for government to be an objective facilitator because isn't government that body 
which should be representing you know, the people? So that's one question. And then for Roger, the other question is about the exit relays, because in a way you would think people would want to be exit relays because then you could really be able to, you know, you'd have plausible deniability. But I'm wondering, is there a traffic issue with being an exit relay that you, you get overloaded with, you know, a lot of stuff coming through your system? Shall I let you go first and then I'll... Sure. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of the exit relays, I think that... Oh, no, wait. <laughs> We, we, could, we could do You're that. You're doing great. We could do that. <laughs> I um, can answer your questions. <laughs> Perfect. I can answer both of your questions. <laughs> Done. Um, so, 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 Helen, I, I appreciate that. Um, it, I, I will say uh, a, a couple of things on that issue. One, um, you know, our commitment in convening the multi-stakeholder engagement was that it, it, it would be open, it would be transparent, it would be consensus-based, and we followed through on that. Um, I understand that everybody's resource constrained. You know, folks in civil society, folks in the academic world, the technical community, um, believe it or not, folks in industry are also resource constrained to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and we recognize that. We have urged folks to work together expeditiously and efficiently in order to um, be cognizant of that. To the group's credit, I will say that the, the kind of core drafters of that code of conduct as, as it moved towards completion included the ACLU, it included um, consumer action, it, it included the Center for Democracy and Technology, it included a lot of folks from civil society. Um, so I, I don't want to give the impression that this is a um, group that was dominated by industry. I also want to be clear that um, this is not a group where um, folks move forward based on a sort of 50% plus one vote, where you know industry would get into a room and outvote privacy advocates. Um, we move forward by consensus, and all of the decisions that were made in that process were either made unanimously, um, and that was the vast majority of cases, or they were made near unanimously. So, so there were a number of circumstances where we had, um, you know, 76 people in the room supporting a path forward and three people opposing, right? So, um, you know, that sort of construct, I think, is, you know, is a very positive one and constructive one moving forward. Um, we would love to be able to have, you know, everybody engaged on this. I mean, it's the more the merrier, but we are cognizant of the resource constraints. Um, and, and we're also, you know, at the conclusion of that first process, uh, before we started up um, the second process, which is uh, tackling facial recognition technology, and we're running one on unmanned aircraft systems right now, and uh, there's going to be a cybersecurity one coming down the road and things like that. Um, you know, we actually asked a bunch of folks, participants and non-participants alike from the community to kind of give us feedback on the first one and say, how can we make this better? How can we make it more open? How can we make it more transparent? How can we make it more consensus-based? Um, and we took those to heart. The, the final question, uh, part of the question was, um, should government act as a neutral convener or um, should it do something more, right? And, and I would simply answer that by saying, as a practical matter, um, NTIA does not have enforcement authority. We don't have the legal authority to be an enforcement entity like the Federal Trade Commission or the Federal Communications Commission. Um, we don't have administrative rulemaking authority in this area, at, like you know other agencies have. Uh, for example, the FAA has administrative rulemaking in the aviation space. We don't have rulemaking authority. Um, we're not Congress. We don't have the ability to pass laws. So to the extent that the government kind of writ large ought to be doing something different, um, I don't think that NTIA has ever taken the position that the FTC ought not pursue privacy initiatives. We're, our colleagues at the FTC do spectacular work. Um, we have never taken the position that folks at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services you know, ought not enforce the HIPAA rule or pursue health privacy rules um, as they are lawfully entitled to do, and they have that legal authority. Um, what we have said is that we think stakeholders can make progress on thorny issues without having NTIA stand there as a rulemaker, as an enforcer. Um, I, I don't know whether that's true in all cases. I, I'm sure that it's true in some cases. So. so you asked why more people aren't excited to run exit relays for the plausible deniability side. The fundamental problem is that we only have millions of users every day, which means many websites have no idea that Tor exists. 
So somebody uses Tor and they're a jerk on the website and the website sees a connection from an IP address and they blame the IP address and it never occurs to them that Tor could exist or that this person, that, that IP address is proxying for somebody else. Uh, so I was talking to uh, Belgian law enforcement long ago and they were saying, yeah, but, but what if the exit relay is only being run by the, by the criminal in order to like hide their criminal activities? Shouldn't we go you know, do the raid anyway, even though we never find anything? Uh, and, and my response, uh, I guess in summary, is if you're running a Tor exit relay in hopes of uh, attracting less attention from what's going on, uh, it's probably not going to work out that way. So mainly the folks who run exit relays are, uh, are in a hosting situation where their ISP understands free speech and wants to support it. So Lori is a fine example where she at a university ran a Tor exit relay and she got to talk to her general counsel and teach them how uh, the internet works. So it's a great advocacy opportunity as well. I got to know them very well. Um, and besides getting to know them very well, um, we also were the highest, um, we had more internet traffic through our Tor node than any other computer on campus until the network people um, told us that we had to cut it out. Um, so we, we did throttle the amount of traffic we would, we would let through so that that wasn't a problem. So this goes back to the incentives question also. We are not lacking for users. We are lacking for a network that can handle them and make it a usable experience. There are many, many, many millions of people out there who would like to be safer on the internet if only there's a tool that's uh, usable enough and fast enough and easy enough. Thank you. Um, questions? Oh, just uh, uh, David Waterman, Federal uh, David Waterman, Federal Communications Commission. Um, Roger, I, I just had a follow-up question for you. I mean, um, do you ha what what could you do if you had more resources? I mean, what is the potential of what you have that you could do? Um, and if you had more money, and do you need more money? And that. I know the answer to that. Yes, we and absolutely. More people yes. cooperating with you. So with technologies like yours, what do you see as the upside potential of them for protecting people's um, So there are rights? a bunch of different pieces to what we do. One of the really important things that we're trying to do is keep up with the browsers. So every six weeks, Mozilla puts out another version of Firefox with a bunch of new interesting privacy bugs, and we have to find them and fix them before we're forced to upgrade because they stop maintaining the old one. So, I mean, Mozilla is a $70 million a year nonprofit trying to keep up with Chrome and uh, IE and so on. Uh, so a lot more resources could be put there in terms of making the applications safer and stronger and so on. Chrome is famous for uh, application security, meaning it's hard to break in, um, but they have all sorts of terrible privacy problems, which uh, they don't care to fix yet. So one of the pieces is uh, we really want to make the applications that you're using a lot safer. Uh, another piece goes back to the, the relays and the network and so on. Um, there are some funders who have uh, given us money to basically subsidize the costs of running relays around the world, and that allows us to uh, have people choose Iceland and Croatia and Brazil and so on, which gives us more diversity around the world. Um, in a lot of places like Australia and South Africa, uh, internet connections are really expensive. So it would be wonderful to be able to say, uh, look, we're not going to pay you to run a relay because that's going to mess up the incentives. But if you incur a cost for running the relay, the primary cost of running an exit relay is not actually your bandwidth costs. It's having Lori build a relationship with her general counsel and so on. So if we can make your bandwidth costs uh, go away, then more people in more places and thus more diversity uh, would be able to, to help out in the network. We also have uh, literally thousands of volunteers who help do advocacy all around the world and it would be great to be able to let them concentrate a little bit more on doing that well for us. So those are yet a few answers. There are a lot more where that came from. Yeah, I have a couple questions on mobile stuff. Um, so the first question is first to speakers. Um, I know like uh, the examples you showed, the screenshots were from Android, and the way that Android apps work is when you install, it says, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and then you install, and you don't know what's happening after that. You just give them the keys to the house. Uh, in contrast, on iOS, you install it, 
and then it says, I'm going to do X, yes or no, I'm going to do Y, yes or no. Um, in the research I've seen, or who's done it on iOS, there's actually a pretty big differentiation on when you look at actual users' devices, people do on uh, prompt by prompt make specific choices about what they do and don't want to share. Um, so just generally want to know your opinions regarding the two kind of philosophical ways of doing permissions on the two platforms. Um, and then in regards to Tor, again, this is kind of on the flip side, Android's doing, I think, a better job. You can use Tor on Android. So I was wondering what are the limitations, because there's no Tor implementation on iOS and jailbreak's a nightmare. Um, so what are the barriers to Tor on iOS, and do you think those barriers will ever be mitigated or removed? There actually is a package for iOS called Onion Browser, and it's probably about as safe as the Orbot package for Android. The problem on both of these is that there is no full-fledged Firefox, so all the application privacy, all the application level privacy stuff I was talking about with JavaScript and fonts and uh, how big your window is uh, and what time zone you're in and cookies and flash and all of those terrible things uh, are basically not addressed on any of the mobile platforms right now because there are no good browsers out there. So we'd love to, to see a world where that's changed and Mozilla's working on it, but slowly. And just in quick response to that, do, I mean mobile devices are fairly uniform, especially with like iPhones, there's like 10 iPhones in existence, probably less than that. Do those types of fingerprinting vulnerabilities go down based on the uniformity of the uh, platforms? Because there's, so, there's only so many fingerprints you're going to get from Safari on uh, iPhone 6, right? Yeah, that's a really interesting research question. Somebody should look into that. I, I suspect, because it happens in every other situation, that there's a lot more diversity than you think, and you'd be surprised about, uh, about how much diversity there is. But I don't know. Somebody should look into it. So for your other question, um, yeah, I think the model that iOS has where you can actually um, uh, accept permissions individually um, makes a lot of sense and is, is good for privacy. Um, on Android, um, uh, they actually implemented that functionality and it was exposed very briefly until they you know, did their next release and kind of took it back. Um, but we, we actually did a study um, with users who had um, that, that functionality and we're able to show that when users had the option of saying, hey, I want this app but I don't want it to you know, track my location, I don't want to give all these permissions, that, that users actually benefited from that fine-grained control. So um, I'm I'm hoping that someday Android will will get that back. I think the other thing, though, that's that's lacking is still for the most part in both platforms is users don't always understand why a um, app is asking for permissions, and um, uh, it it's uh, it's useful for for them to for the app to actually explain what it's going to do with the data and not just what permission they need, and that's something that we're not really seeing much of. I have another answer for the iOS side. Everything that has to do with the word super cookie, it's not about diversity of users, it's about vulnerability to the websites embedding a tracking signature and then recognizing you later. Well, I'm going to have to make that the last question because I have an Amtrak train that I have to catch so the moderator's got to run. So thank uh, our speakers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, if there's a reception, catch them afterwards and uh, ask all the questions because... Uh, You've got the experts here. Thank you. And uh, yes, there there is a reception, Jonathan. I'm sorry you'll be able, you won't be able to uh, join <laughs> us, but uh, on behalf of uh, Christopher Yu and the center and the law school, thank you all very much. Thank you very much to our speakers this afternoon. This was a fantastic conference. I know there'll be a lot of follow-up questions. Um, we will be posting slides uh, from, the, uh, from the speakers on our website, so keep an eye open for that. There will be a reception uh, that's starting right now down in the Great Hall. That is the building that we were just in earlier, uh, down on the main floor, so not nearly as many steps. And uh, you can, uh, our caterer has created a signature cocktail for the evening. Uh, it's called the Firewall. I have no idea what's in it. <laughs> so thank you again very much.